Afternoon all, welcome to today's IMAA Insights and Innovations webinar. I'll start with our acknowledgement of country. We gather today on Terrible People's Land to continue our learning journey together. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people as the traditional custodians on the land that we meet. We pay our respects to the elders of past, present and emerging and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. We're clicking through the deck. There we go. I'm Alison Powell and I'm head of agency for Bishop Outdoor Advertising. Personally, as someone that has planned regional media for the past two decades, and now working for a company that is truly passionate about regional businesses and communities, we are so pleased to be hosting this webinar today. Move 2.0 will be arriving in 2024, and the new platform will bring a new level of data granularity. And today is the first time that we start to talk about the future measurement of regional out of home in Australia. And I love the fact that we're having this conversation first with IMAA members. It's also great timing as the IMAA Academy has just launched out of home 101. And I'll point out that the next upcoming course is the Regional 101. So we are tying the two together today. Soon media planners and buyers will have a world-class, detailed and reliable toolbox at their fingertips that maps all of Australia. You'll be hearing today from outdoor experts on Move 2.0. I'm really pleased to introduce Tim Beach, who is the CEO of Beach Lister Consulting. Um, I have to pass on my apologies because Monica Jabutsky was supposed to join us today from Ipsos, but Grant's going to jump in and, and do her section. Um, but I'll hand the reins over to Moves 2.0 lead, Grant Gustin, today. And thank you so much, Grant. Thank you, Alison. Um, so, yes, uh, welcome, everyone. I uh, hope today you'll get a good understanding of what Move 2.0 will be um, and how it will help you in planning and buying regional out of home and out of home nationally as a whole. As Alison said, Move 2.0 is going to measure regional signs across the country and what it means in terms of audience measurement firstly is I just want to sort of take a step back and say you know, how do we how do we arrive at Move 2.0? What is it that makes it different to the previous move and that is a new system? And what did Move do that that you know was new to audience measurement for out of home? So if you're old enough to have been around before Move existed or you're still buying the regional now, is that before we had an audience measurement system, we had traffic counts. And really what people were doing was taking a traffic count applying you know, an average vehicle occupancy and applying that to a sign. And when Move came along in 2010, we said, well, we can do a little bit better than that. We'll model the people and we'll pick up all the different um, information that's available to us and measure not just the roadside, but the airports, the shopping centres and stations and transit in the five capital cities at the time. And what we did was we didn't just say, you know, who's in front of the sign, but looking at the size, the sign, the characteristics, the sign, the environment. So what is the viewing distance that people can see that sign from? And then apply visibility studies in terms of eye tracking to say, well, you know, if that's where they can see it from, how many are actually looking? And that's where the likelihood to see came along. So we end up with different audiences based on the size of the sign and the viewing characteristics of the sign. And then digital came along. So in 2019, we then said, well, there's another dimension we need to add to this. And in 2.0, we're measuring it at an individual sign level, whilst in Move 1.5 in the cap cities at the moment, we're just measuring it um, based on averages. But really, the audience dwell time, how long are they in front of the sign, the ad play length and the share of time that you're buying, all influences whether your advertiser's sign will, your advertiser's campaign will be on the screen at the same time the audience is passing the site or how many of them will see it. So we've got another dimension that we need to add in for the digital measurement. That's really what Move 2.0 is about, is building a system that is capable of doing all of that. So Move 2.0 is basically all formats nationwide. So we bring in place-based and we're doing this nationwide and it's hourly data for 365 days of the year, which means we've now got seasonality, which is a completely new thing for us as well. So it's a very complex system and what it actually means in order to do it is that it's a complete rebuild. Like we're not just saying let's add in regional signage to the existing Move 1.5 system. It's we need to take it pull it apart and put it back together as a completely new system because there's lots more data sets that we need to bring in. We're measuring place-based. We've got more granular transport network. You'll see all of this in a minute in some images, but you know, point of interest data. We've got new models capable of handling all of that data. So at the moment, we need to have a model that produces an audience for a single week. 
Um, and so you have one audience number. Now we're producing audience data for all 365 days of the year at an hourly level we have 16,000 audience numbers. So we need a complete rebuild to be able to handle that. Lots more granularity available to us in terms of demographic movements, temporal granularity, seasonality, and in the indoor space for airport shopping centers and train stations or all stations, not just train stations, we now have a far more complex internal model. You'll see an example of that and what that means in terms of the results. The audience calculation for digital and individual level, more formats nationwide. And for a geographical area, and I'll talk a bit more about in reporting, we're able to understand who is the local audience, the people that live within the geographical area that you want to measure, and the and the visitors who are from outside of Australia. So at the airport, it's not just the, the local audience, it's the visitors at airports as well. And lots more demographics and greater connection to the data. So it's a completely new system. Easiest way for me to describe it is in these six blocks, and we'll walk through these and some of the things we're doing in those. But the first is, you know, people. We need to uh, have a group of people that we're measuring. So we have a synthetic population, and, you know, that's 10% of Australia, and each one of those individually will make a trip, and each one of those individually will represent 10 other people who are similar to themselves in terms of age, gender, and, and so forth. We then have a range of behaviour data. We've got a, our own survey that we're doing, tracking people second by second in a very complex way. We've got third party data accounts. We're bringing in mobile data, which offers an opportunity to look at things on a macro level and a whole range of other data sets. And we'll touch on some of those. And then with all these data sets, we say, well, how do we move people around? Well, there's two basic models that we have, one being the activity-based model, which is your everyday model. And this moves people around from their home to all their trips within 150 kilometers of the home. And then we have an out-of-market model, which is taking people on the days that they are traveling on a daily basis further than 150 kilometers, or they're traveling overnight more than 40 kilometers. And 40 kilometers because one of the data sets we can tap into is the federal government's national visitor survey, and that's the length of distance they use for overnight trips in that survey. But you now we need a transport network to move people around on and indoor models to work with the new approach for, as I said, airports, trains and shopping centres. Once we've got all those complete picture of movements, we then start to say, what are our members got? Where is the inventory? What do we need to measure? What are the locations of the sign? You know, where the, can they be viewed from? And from all of that, putting those two pieces together, the people movement and the locations of the signs, we can produce the audience data. And we'll have visibility adjusted contacts, which are similar to likelihood to see, and that we are adjusting based on the characteristics of the sign, the characteristics of the location, and um, the audience modes that they're traveling past to say who is going to be looking at these sides. And all of that goes into new <coughs> excuse me. All of that goes into new reporting software, which will enable you to better understand all of your out-of-home signs that you're buying across Australia. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those things in more detail and then pass on to Tim to talk about some of the others. But the synthetic population, as I said, it's 10% of the population. It's two and a half million people. Uh, we're measuring people 14 plus, so it's about 2 million people aged 14 plus, and each one of those individually will make a trip. In terms of the demographic attributes that each of those people have is on the right-hand side. You can see that we've got their age in there, their gender, what status are they in terms of student, working full-time, working part-time, the industry they're employed in, the occupation, all of those other things that are listed along there. I'm not going to go through each of them individually. And every single person has those attributes at an individual respondent level. So, you know, once we start to look at how we can bundle those up in the years to come, we have thousands of possible demographics. I'm not going to try and overload that at launch. We'll probably keep more simplistic to the current move level so that you start to understand seasonality before we get too carried away with demographics. But you can see that the pictures we're building here are much deeper and more granular than what we currently have. In terms of the behaviour data, um, talk, uh, you know, lots of different ones, but one of the ones we've done is a survey of about 5,000 people, and it's got a it's second by second tracking. The respondents have undertaken these surveys for 14 days. The device, you can see a little bit of a picture of there on the left, but if I just hold up, that's actually the device itself. It's very tiny, and they've carried that around for 14 days, and it's not just tracking them second by second on their location via GPS. It's also got acceleration and a barometer and a gyroscope, so when they start to move indoors 
um, versus outdoors, we can start to pick up those different temperature changes, know they've moved into an indoor environment. We've mapped all those indoor environments. We can start to see them moving up and down in floors in shopping centres and buildings and so forth. So it's a very granular picture um, of not just their movements, but also who they are because we've recruited them. We know how old they are, what occupation do they have, what income do they have. And when they arrive at a location, they've been checking in and telling us, yes, I've come to the shopping centre to do my grocery shopping, or yes, I've come to the shopping centre to get a haircut. So there's you know, a very detailed picture of their travel that we're picking up. What are the results showing specifically for regional is you can see here the numbers. You know, we've managed to collect 2,000, have completed the measurement out of the 5,000. And, you know, in terms of shopping centres, we've had 297 regional shopping centres where people have gone through and we have pathways of these people inside those shopping centres. And of the of the 30 odd airports that we're measuring, 11 regional airports um, have also got people moving through there and we can see their pathways through these particular locations. So we're starting to build up a very detailed picture of their behaviour. And here is you know, some of the top line numbers here in terms of where we're at. In terms of males versus females, about 53% uh, were females. And you can start to see the age splits in terms of metro versus regional are very similar. We get most of the respondents in the 30 to 64 range. And in terms of regional Australia in total, um, they travelled 1.4 million kilometres, those 2,000 people. Uh, and you can see the number of average days collected was 11. In terms of the number of stops, they had 128,000 stops over those 1.4 million kilometres. So there's 128,000 locations that people have gone during this survey period that we can start to build up a very robust picture of their behaviour. In terms of versus the metro, uh, what we can see is that, you know, we've got 1.4 million worth of kilometres out of those 2,000 people. In the metro markets, we've got 2.2 million but we've got 3,000 people. So you know, what we're seeing is the average distance per trip in the regional areas is longer. And I don't think that's, um, it comes as a surprise, but it's also quicker to make. So it's 11 kilometres for a trip and takes about 10 minutes to make versus in the metro areas, we're seeing it's about eight kilometres for an average distance. So three kilometres shorter, but it takes them over 11 minutes to make that trip. And you start to see those those behaviours coming through. So what this really means in, in terms of the new move system is that individual geographical areas are not all going to behave the same way. Metro areas are going to be different to regional areas. And Tim will talk a bit more about, about that when you start to see some of that, how the, in the, even the regional areas, it breaks out by geographical size of um, population in those areas. In terms of you know what mode of transport do we use in regional areas versus the metro areas for our everyday travel? Um, you know, not surprisingly, the private vehicle is is um, more dominant than in the metro markets, where more public transport options are available. In terms of active travel, what is the difference between what does that mean? That means walking, but also cycling and things like that. So you can see that there's a little bit more walking and cycling in the in the metro areas, which I think is not surprising. Uh, again, given some of those distances that they were doing on average were shorter distances. In terms of time of day, um, we start to see, uh, again, the difference here in the metro versus regional is that it's a little bit stronger in the in the peak hour in the morning in the metro markets, but also a little bit more happening at night in the metro markets as well, which I don't think is too much as a, of a surprise um, given the options that are available uh, in terms of uh, theatre and things like that. And on the weekends, uh, the peak for both the metro and regional areas is in the morning, and they're quite strong. You know, parents taking children to sport, people doing their shopping in the morning, freeing up their, their weekends for the rest of their, their time. But again, a little bit of a difference there. We see a little bit, bit stronger peak in the morning um, and a little bit more in the evening in the metro markets. So that's the sort of information, um, along with mobile data and a whole range of other data sets, which Tim will talk about in a second, that we now start to put into these people movements. And one of the things, though, that, that this is all about putting the models together, which Tim will talk about, but also collecting all of the information. So you know, one of the things we need if we're going to have people moving around is a, is a picture of the transport network. And I'll just touch briefly on the, on the, on the roads, and then Tim will talk about... Um, <coughs> the public transport network. But you know, here you are looking at 
a picture of the transport network for roads that we have built for Australia. So it is every road in the country, whether it is a dirt track through to a major freeway, every single one of them is in the system. It's 7 million kilometres worth, um, or 7 million links, I should say, and 3.7 million kilometres worth of travel. And if you were to do the old school and you know drive and have a look at all the signs on them, it would take you six years of travelling non-stop to go travel all of these roads. So it is a very complex picture of, of where we could travel. And we haven't put anyone on there yet. We just need to build this so that we could have places that people could go to and how they could get there. But I'll pass you on to Tim to talk more now about the inputs we're putting into the system and the models that we're building around it. Cool. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, yeah, so I'm Tim Veach, I'm from VLC, and our company has been building most of the, the people movement models in Move2. So as Grant's kind of mentioned, the, the goal for us is really to model all the travel that people make over an entire year. And so we need to represent all the different ways that people can move around. Uh, Grant's mentioned the road network, but we also need to represent the public transport system that exists. And so we represent uh, the public transport system in, in its entirety with trains, buses, trams, ferries, that kind of stuff. And we represent where where services stop. You can see there's about 86,000 individual public transport stops, which could be individual bus stops or train stations, that kind of stuff. And we also represent all the different routes that exist. So the paths that they take, the how often they run, where they stop, that kind of thing. And we model all the different route variations of those routes as well. So express services, all stops, all of that kind of thing. So it's a very detailed representation of the, the public transport system. We also model the, the travel that people make out of market. And obviously airports are a key way that people can get around. And so MOVE has been extended to cover um, airports nationally. We've got about 30 odd airports measured. Uh, one major difference compared to MOVE 1 is where MOVE 1 only modelled the local residents using an airport, MOVE 2 has been extended so that the, the people at the airport include visitors from, for example, interstate, as well as international visitors. And you can see um, the, the catchments of individual airports on the, the map on the right, that's showing where people come from on their way to a particular airport and some regional airports have quite large catchments as you might expect. So we're, we're building a model here as part of Move2. Um, we, we're modeling synthetic people and how they travel around. But it's very important that we make sure that the outputs of the model match the real world. And so for that, we have uh, assembled a, a database of count data covering the country basically trying to source all publicly available counts that exist in Australia. Um, it includes traffic counts, public transport counts that are typically based on ticketing data, um, as well as some uh, shopping centre counts, airport passenger numbers, all of that kind of stuff. And there's about 36,000 locations where we've got a count uh, across the country. You can see them on the right there. And um, while there's 36,000 locations, we also often get uh, very granular data by time of day, by day of week, by month, and so on. And so that the actual number of data points that we have is closer to 24 million. So it's a huge amount of, of observed data measuring actual travel across the country. So uh, we mentioned before that um, our goal is to, mo to model people. And um, the, the best data source we have on where people live is the census. And we get data from the census at SA1 level, which is the most detailed level you can get the data at. And it's typically little areas uh, that represent about 400 people. And so there's 60,000 of them across Australia. You can see on the right, um, it's a little bit hard when you zoom out at this level to see the 60,000 areas, but um, within metro areas, they're quite small. In the, the middle of the desert, they're quite large. Um, but for each of those areas, we know who lives there their demographic, how many people there are. And our goal in the model is to model the travel they make from one zone to another. So these these 60 odd thousand zones become the, the origins and destinations of the trips that people make. Uh, we also 
have a slightly more aggregate zone system based on SA2s for modeling long distance travel. So people going on holidays, um, interstate, that kind of stuff. And there's about two, two and a half thousand of those uh, areas for representing the origins and destinations of those trips. So those travel zones uh, represent the origins and destinations of trips. And we, we know who lives in each of those zones. But in order to model people's travel, we also need to know the, the things that they might travel to. And so we have a, a points of interest database. Um, it contains about 1 million points nationwide. This includes all the, the points that you might see in Google Maps. So all the cafes, all the supermarkets, all the petrol stations, all the gyms, all the pharmacies and so on. And there's a, a, about 100 different categories of points of interest and this covers basically everything across Australia. And so we, we take account of the locations of all of these when we're modeling people's travel. And we also account for their opening hours. So um, basically like you would in the real world, people account for opening hours when deciding where to travel. So as Grant mentioned, there's two models um, that we've built as part of Move2 for modeling how people travel around. One is the activity-based model, which is responsible for people's day-to-day -day travel within 150 kilometers of home. The other is the out-of-market model, which models the, the less frequent travel that people make um, out of their home market, whether it's for business or holidays or visiting friends and family. The activity-based model, so the day-to-day the -day model, um, there was an activity-based model in Move 1, but it only accounted for two demographic variables, two main demographic variables you can see on the left. One was the, the person's primary status, so whether they were a full-time worker, part-time worker, student, and so on, and whether they were a main grocery buyer. The models in Move 2 are far richer, and they take account of all of the, the demographic attributes of a person when predicting how they travel. So. As some simple examples, grocery buyers will go to the supermarket more often than non-grocery buyers. Young people go to gyms more often than um, other people. Um, people with kids might do drop-offs to school or to the pharmacy or doctors. I don't know what, what parents do. I should know. I am a parent. Um, but basically, all these demographic variables are taken into account when predicting how people travel around. And the types of travel that we model are far richer and a lot of that's possible because of that point of interest database that we we mentioned earlier so move one accounted for about six different types of travel work education shopping recreation that kind of thing in move two those purposes are broken down in in a lot more detail um, you can see uh, shopping is broken down into things like department stores fashion stores petrol stations pharmacies supermarkets and there's lots of different types of recreation, like going to the cinema, casino, beach, gym, golf, and so on. So there's a lot more detail there. So with the move to digital, we're also trying to model the, the time of day, day of week, seasonality uh, patterns of travel behavior. And so you can see a few charts here just showing that the second chart shows uh, how trip numbers vary by a day of the week with lowest trip. Uh, trip rates on Sundays, as you would expect. We also see lower trip rates on public holidays, um, higher trips obviously during school term and, and similarly high during school holidays as well. And being a nationwide system, we also need to model how travel varies across the country. And as Grant mentioned, we, we modeled this uniquely for each SA1 across the country. So th there are a, a multitude of different travel patterns that exist. Uh, but just to, I guess, give a high level view of how regional varies from metro, you can see on the left a, a plot of how trip lengths vary uh, between different areas. Um, you can see the longer trip lengths there relate to rural areas uh, where trip lengths are, are much longer. On the right, there's a, a chart showing how public transport mode share. Uh, this is a particular type of public transport usage where you walk to and from the system. And it's basically highest in the metro areas at around 6 or 7%, but it declines to less than 1% in rural areas. And so, yeah, the model is trying to pick up how people behave differently in these different types of areas. So everything I've been speaking about there is trying to model people's 
uh, kind of macro travel movements as they move around a city. Move to also includes indoor models of shopping centers, airports, and train stations, trying to model how people move around in those environments. And the, the survey that Ipsos have collected with that uh, little GPS tracker that Grant showed, that's the data source to, that's used to build the models of how people move around these environments. But it's also backed by very rich data for individual locations, um, basically heat maps derived from mobile data, mobile phone data. You can see in the middle there, there's a, a little heat map for a particular shopping center with kind of heater, hotter areas uh, in the corridors. Um, we have that for each shopping center, airport, train station around the country, and that's used to produce unique patterns of travel for each one. So with that, you can, in some cases, produce quite interesting demographic variations within internal environments. So this is a particular train station in Sydney, the Hound Hall station. And because we model the how different lines arrive at different platforms, we can actually produce di different demographic profiles or inventory on individual platforms. And here we're showing average personal income and the, the two highest uh, kind of income levels are at platform two and platform four at Town Hall, which happen to be the lines where the eastern suburbs uh, trains come in, as well as the North Shore trains. So people from more affluent areas result in higher income profiles on those platforms. So there, there are very rich models in this system, the activity-based model, the out-of-market model. But as I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that those models produce outputs that match the real world. And so there's two stages of calibration that go on to real world data. The first is to mobile phone data, where we, we have anonymized mobile phone data from which we can uh, measure real world travel patterns. And so that's the first stage. The second stage uh, is where we use all the count data that I mentioned earlier, all the, the 36,000 different count locations. So the outputs of the system are calibrated to closely match all of those different types of counts. And on the right there, you can see the output of that is what we call the traffic intensity model, which is basically the, the estimated volume of travel on each part of the transport system. So I've spoken about the people movement models there. Um, I think Grant's gonna probably take over to here to talk about the audience data. Thanks, Tim. Uh so what does that mean in terms of the audience data? We're taking all these people, if my slide moves, we're taking all these people, we're moving them around and then we're attaching them to the size. And what it really means then in terms of the audience data is you, know, you saw in that demographics that we're going to have much more granularity in terms of the trip purposes they're making, in terms of the places they're going to. So all of that then with all the, the calibration that is going on through the mobile data and to the real world counts means that the it, the accuracy of the system is increasing as well. So Move 2.0 is delivering a much more granular and accurate picture of travel than the current system does, especially when it comes to digital. So what are you going to be able to do with that, all that data in terms of you know, understanding the, the weekly audiences around signs and how they vary across the year is you'll be able to understand it on two levels. So first of all, the bringing everything back to the SA1 level means that the local residents are going to be able to be measured in terms of, so for example, if I was doing regional Queensland, I could look at the Cairns TV region and say, people that are living in there, how many of them are interacting with Cairns Airport, but also the visitor component um, from Australia is coming in to be able to say, well, and how many of the people at Cairns Airport are from outside of um, the, the Cairns TV region. And that's going to occur for any particular geographical region that you're looking at across the country and the opportunity to, to look at that at a TV region or a state-based region or what have you. Understand the local audience, whoever you define them as, and the rest of the audience in terms of visitors to get the national picture to come together. Timeline wise, 2024 is not too far away, but what is that? What are, what are we, where are we up to in, in everything here? So at the moment we have the, probably the yellow milestones are the ones to look at is that on the 23rd of November, we will finish development. That means everything will be built. Um, all the data will have been collected. It's been collected now and been put into these models and producing audience data. We've got a, uh, a national version of that coming out um, at the end of this month. That is 
you know, parts of the methodology are not complete, but it gives us a feel to see how we're tracking with all of that. Once the data arrives, uh, the membership, all the uh, OMA um, display members will be looking at the data, understanding it, and getting their heads around it. But at the same time, we'll start to, you know, prepare for launch with agencies and get all of the the training materials together and all of the insights that we as MOVE can pull together on that and then start to do the agency training around Easter next year on the software that we will build for this. So that, I suppose, gives you a picture of the the, the new measurement that we have coming for Australia-wide regional signs for the first time is exciting all formats will be there all the airports will be there the airports will have not just the people from the local market like this is all we measure at the moment but also the people that are there who've come for holidays for business for visiting family and friends so i hope that gave you a good understanding of what we're building um, and thank you and i'll open that up now for questions might be easier if you just pop your questions in the chat box if you have any. I'll give it 30 seconds. Um, but you're right, Grant, like 2024 really isn't that far away and we'll be in that platform before we know it. We so will. you just said then training will kick off in Easter. So that will that be end of March, April 2024? Yeah. yeah, okay. Amazing. I thought I'd also mention... Um, just so everyone on the call knows, like Move 2.0 is free for agencies to have access to. The platform license and all operator training are all free of charge. So please reach out to the OMA um, if you want to start onboarding now. Um, we're going to have the most thorough detailed measurement tool available. So just keep an eye out for more information as we're moving closer to Move 2.0. Um, I don't know if we do have any further questions, but I mean, huge thanks to you, Grant and Tim um, and the OMA. What's happening? It's a very exciting space. It is. We have a question. We do. Yeah, wonderful. How regularly are these measurements done? <laughs> <laughs> ongoing really um so the survey we've conducted the first of our surveys which is over 12 months um we, we haven't yet scheduled the next one of those but that you know that's given us a fairly robust picture in terms of the counts information the mobile data information uh all of that is updated on a regular basis uh like for example the national results that i talked about we're using the 2016 census and mobile data um, from last year, the March release coming out next year is using mobile data from this year. So, uh, as not all these data sets are updated at the same level of frequency, like Tim talked about the count locations, some of those are released annually, some of those are released monthly. But as the data is available, it will be updated into the system on an ongoing basis so that we've got the best picture of travel at any one point in time we can possibly give. Amazing. Thanks, Jenna. Anything further? I think that might be it. Look, if anyone comes up with any questions later, they can always reach out to to move and to myself and we'll, we'll answer them. But yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there was a lot to unpack there anyway. Um, fantastic. This session is recorded and you can go back <laughs> and break it down into uh, slower chunks. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have the rest of your Monday. Thank you. Thanks so much for Thank that, guys. And if there are any more questions that do come through, please feel free. Please feel free to send the questions through to us, and we can get you in touch with the the team at OMA or Bishop as well. So, don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you, guys, for a wonderful presentation again. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Bye. Bye.